Our session that we're going to have today is going to be on a research study that I recently completed uh, with Dr. Erin Barth, who is here on the call with us today from Dialectic. And Erin and I set out to study how people were feeling with remote work and, and not just the mechanical sides of remote work, like the actual shift to picking up your laptop and going to your home and suddenly turning your dining room into an office. Um, but what were the impacts on things like inclusion and connection and belonging? So that's going to be the basis of our conversation today. So I'd love to hand it over to Erin to introduce himself and just give us a bit of a background of dialectic and their work. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm Aaron Barth. Uh, I'm the president and founder of Dialectic and DEI Learning Snippets. Uh, so Dialectic uh, produces um, custom e-learning based on science. And one of the uh, products that we've developed are uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion learning snippets. So they're micro-learning lessons, um, scenario-based exercises sent right to your phone that take less than two minutes to do based on the latest uh, learning science and empirical work in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I've had the pleasure of working with um, Bev on this research project where, as she said, we were looking at the impact of remote work on belonging and inclusion. So it's very uh, connected with the kind of work that we do um, on the, um, you know, technology side and the, the, the um, learning side of uh, creating inclusive, inclusive workplaces. So I'm really excited to be sharing it. We've been doing a little bit of a uh, press tour uh, and um, it's been really fun talking about this and um, you know, really excited to, to hear your thoughts and how remote work has impacted inclusion at your organizations and in your life. Yeah, thanks, Erin. And, uh, you know, we, we come at the world from different perspectives, um, but with a united uh, approach around making work better for individuals in the workplace. So that's why conversations like this one that we're going to have today are so important, right? Because uh, we need to collectively be working on how do we improve the experience that every person has in their workplace. So I assume that because you're on the call today, you're also interested in that outcome. So really looking forward to your participation as we move through the conversation here today. So um, the format of these conversations events is a little bit different. Uh, it is really intended to be a roundtable dialogue. Erin um, and I are most certainly going to guide the conversation, but we do welcome participation. So if you'd like to um, add a comment, ask a question, be involved in some way other than simply listening, which is perfectly fine too. Um, please use whichever mode is appropriate for you. So you can use the raise hand tool, you can pop something in the chat. Um, my colleague um, from Jocelyn Vincent is going to be moderating those uh, chat contributions. So please feel free to use that facility. You can also just unmute yourself, turn your video on and uh, pop in and, and join in if you'd like to add to something that Erin and I are talking about. So please feel free to um, use this time that we have together to your best advantage. Um, it is most certainly our intention to give you relevant and useful information that you can take away and really apply and think about in your own uh, work life, as well as the organization that you might be part of, or if you're in a consulting um, capacity, things that you might be able to think about to help your own customers. So um, with that housekeeping out of the way, um, why don't we jump right in to just like, let's break the ice a little bit here. And I'd love to hear from a few other people if you would be willing to contribute. Um, how is remote work making you feel right now, assuming that you are a remote worker yourself? So is there anyone who'd be brave enough? I know it's a little bit scary to be the first one, but if there's someone who'd be prepared to add a, just a couple of words about how you're feeling, um, please just uh, jump into the chat um, or unmute yourself. So Andrea, hi Andrea, it's good to see you. Um, she says that honestly it's lonely sometimes and um, yep I think we can probably all relate to that a little bit. Um, many of our survey respondents over 80 percent could relate to that at least a little bit so it's definitely something that is pervasive. Um, what else are people feeling? Go ahead Zuhal, thank you, nice to see you. You can just, perfect, go for it. Hi, good morning. So uh, thank you for this amazing opportunity. And as I heard very recently, the research shows that the 
a length of the meetings uh, are getting longer with this working from home or remote work uh, situation. So that was interesting to me because I think I am not the only one feeling drained out of being less active, almost sitting all day, but feeling very tired at the end of the day. So the meetings getting longer, the more we attach to the screens, I think impacting not only mentally, physically as well. So overall, it is feeling tired. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Erin, did you want to just jump in with a response around, you know, what we might have heard in the survey that would align with what Suhal is feeling? Yeah, I mean, people are uh, just exhausted. I mean, that's, that's uh, pretty clear. Um, and one of the, I mean, I think you kind of, this isn't from the, from the report, but um, the mental, uh, just literally the calories it takes your body to process all the information that's on a screen um, is a lot. And if, and, and in particular switching tasks, for example, is very um, energy uh, reliant and, and, and requires a lot of energy to do. And that's kind of what we're doing a lot of is switching tasks when working remotely. Uh, you know, we're in a meeting, then we're working on a document, then we're in another meeting, you know, and so you're constantly switching and that switching is a, you know, firstly, it's a high, there's a high cost to your productivity because it usually takes about 15 to 20 minutes to active, to um, effectively change your focus. But it also takes a lot of energy uh, to, for your brain to like change context and get into something else. And so I think that that's why people are um, likely feeling uh, quite uh, tired. Yeah, abs absolutely. And I mean, it's just the, it's the transactional nature of how we're working right now as well, right? And, um, you know, um, I know that Daniel is waiting to jump in with, with his thoughts, but that is definitely one of the things that we saw in the, mm -hmm. the research was just this, the way that we're operating is not sustainable and tenable for the long term either, right? So, um, Daniel, what are you feeling? I'm actually feeling okay because we are, we are, we are a nonprofit organization, BC Construction Association for the entire greater Vancouver in, in our program, in my program, I'm the only one. Although I do share the uh, office locations with other programs and organizations, uh, when, I'm, when I was able to go to work there, I get to waste my time uh, <laughs> doing, doing mingling with them, right? Coffee mm -hmm. break or lunch break. I, I, I haven't had that opportunity, but then I realized actually Zoom meeting or Microsoft Teams are kind of a unique, like what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also develop my multi-tasking skills. Like this morning, I was uh, exercising, I was doing my laundry, and I was actually cooking my lunch. And now I'm in a meeting. I feel good about that, but I still like to see people in person. Hopefully <laughs> the COVID thing will be gone sooner. Well, it seems like you've learned to be, or maybe you've always been like that, very efficient with your, your time. Well, well, thank you for, for sharing. Um, there are a couple of other comments in the chat about being disconnected, lonely, um, especially when you live on your own. Um, you, know, you know, and these are really fairly universal feelings I think that people are having and um, you know so Erin why don't we dip into our two big insights that we saw in the research because it's really being echoed in what we've just heard from around the table here already this morning. Yeah so um, the two big insights are um, the first is that the, sh the cost of short-term planning um, which is really what we've been engaged in for about a year is just, I'm, I, I, you know, I solve this problem, then I solve this problem, then I solve this problem. Um, the cost of that is a negative impact on feelings of belonging because essentially those uh, moments uh, that was just mentioned, you know, that Daniel mentioned, those, those moments where you actually get a break, 
uh, and you talk to someone and you make that connection, they're not happening. So that that's all being crowded out by a very um, intense focus on uh, short-term tasks. And the long-term impact on that is a, is a negative impact on our feelings of connection. So that's like the, that's the high, highest level insight that we saw. And, and it's, you know, not going to be good for organizations long-term if we remain in that kind of space. Um, the second is that, um, with respect to inclusion and belonging, there are traditional categories of, of those things and barriers to, to feeling included. Um, and those are things about, uh, you know, stereotypes, prejudice, discrimination, you know, that has to do with race, gender, sexual orientation, and things like that. So people can feel a barrier to feeling included because of those categories. So all of that still exists. And then on top of that, what remote work has done as has expanded it, first, it's exacerbated some of those traditional issues, and then it's expanded the, the kinds of barriers to inclusion that people feel. So things like, as people have talked about here, social isolation, um, uh, a feeling of disconnection, uh, communication obstacles, technology, right? like not having a good internet connection. So all of these things, when you're working in a remote context, can... Uh, or have created new barriers to our um, to our feelings of belonging in our organizations. So those are the two big um, the big takeaways from the 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 study that we did. And and Aaron, to some extent, those were not that surprising to us, given what we know about how we are all feeling anecdotally, as well as uh, you know what we've seen unfold over the past year. But what we did find interesting was when we started to step down into sort of the weeds of the data, we came across a few quite interesting contradictions at, at face value in, in the data. So um, why don't we talk about those just loosely and then let's open it up to, to the group to see if anyone is um, echoing those, those thoughts or things that we observed. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell us about the, the curious finding around performance and belonging? Yeah, I will. And we're really interested to hear if if you have experienced any of this. So I'll explain some of this stuff and then we'd love to hear from you. So um, one of the big counterintuitive things that we found is that actually performance has increased. So people's productivity is better, but their, their feelings of belonging have worsened. And um, why that's interesting is that if you look at the empirical work on performance in the workplace, um, there are three things you have to satisfy to, uh, to have motivated uh, employees who are engaged and therefore perform well. Uh, the first is autonomy. So that's, you know, having um, some freedom over what you do and when you do it. Uh, the second is mastery, which is the um, opportunity to get better at things you care about. And the third is belonging. So feeling part of something uh, bigger than yourself. And so you would expect that if people's feelings of belonging um, have decreased, their performance would decrease. That's what the empirical models uh, suggest. But in the short term here, what we've seen is actually people's uh, performance has increased while belonging has decreased. So um, there's some reasons for that that we've uh, speculated about. Um, one is that, um, I mean, just pragmatic things like commutes have been eliminated. So that's, let's say, I mean, I live in Southern Ontario. I'm, there's people that live around me that commute to Toronto. That's an hour, an hour and a half, both ways. So that's two to three hours of otherwise dead space, right? In your day. Now, valuable maybe in other ways, like allows you to, I don't know, listen to music and do things that fill you up as a whole human being, but there are, those are th two to three hours of productivity time that aren't being used, which now we can access. Um, so that's like, f that's one reason why we might see an increase in performance. Um, so th there are, what the empirical models suggest though, is that this long term is not going to work that over time, if we allow feelings of belonging and inclusion to erode, 
performance is ultimately going to go down. So I'm curious if you guys, uh, you know, in your, in your experience so far, have you felt that, that you actually feel more productive sometimes, um, but feel disconnected from your, um, your, your colleagues and your organization? Has anyone ha experienced that? Well, someone said yes. Uh, yep. Um, so someone said it's definitely easier to do deep work and focus on tasks. Yeah. And that's a really interesting point. I don't know if you've read the book, deep work, uh, but that's, um, that's the ability to focus on one thing and, and do it really well. Right. Um, and so if you have more time, it's sort of like what's happened with people is that they've, um, there's it, their life in general is more complicated and crazy and weird. And you've got all these other distractions, but when people decide to focus on tasks, they're able to do that for longer periods of time. Um, so Brian's mentioned in our organization, we believe we saw an uptick in productivity early in the remote change, uh, but it is dipping the longer it goes. And that's, well, there you go. That's exactly what we expect to happen that early on when we're in this, uh, you know, and we still are to some extent in this, um, crisis mode, uh, everybody's very focused, getting stuff done, making sure things continue to run, making sure projects continue to go doing the things that were necessary to stay afloat. And then over, and, and so we're really productive early on and maybe in some ways enjoying the remote work, you know, having control over our days a little bit more, but as it's waned on, this is exactly what we'd expect is that the productivity is going to start to dip. And one of the reasons why that you might not be hearing about is because is precisely because our feeling of belonging and connection have, have decreased. You're going to be less motivated if you feel isolated and not part of a broader group of people who are trying to achieve a common goal. I mean, we're social creatures, right? We, we it's not a nice to have, it's a requirement to interact with other humans, connect with them and work with them towards common goals. Anyone else, anyone else have, uh, you know, so sort of their experience, their productivity, uh, experience, uh, yeah, as a hall, um, feel free to jump in. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, as a, as a personal experience, uh, I was, uh, feeling very, uh, weird thing that I could hardly remember some details, some names, some notes. Where did I put it? Oh, I heard about this. What was that kind of short term memory loss? Right. And I was starting to think that I'm going mad. Right. <laughs> then, then I listen to the, maybe it is the perception uh, priority. I listen to a, a professor at CBC News on the radio and he scientifically explained this situation by saying that uh, our brain, human brain, doesn't feel comfortable with unpredictability, yes. especially when it turns out to be a chronic unpredictability. Yes. So it releases chemicals and hormones in the long run may also have impact on our other uh, body parts and organs as well. And he called it as a brain fog, or uh, I think it has been called as uh, COVID brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It didn't feel quite all right that some other people are thinking the same or feeling the same way, but at least there is a scientific justification or explanation behind this feeling. And yes, yeah. still, I'm, I'm glad I remembered to log into this, uh, webinar today. So still I'm doing okay, but yeah, on a daily <laughs> basis, I'm missing some details and I'm trying to get used to this one. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's a, when that, what you're describing there is what's, you know, known as a stress response. So one thing that causes a lot of stress for us is uncertainty and we can live in that uncertain space for a while, uh, and use our, uh, intuitive, uh, decision-making skills to be able to navigate those, um, 
to make decisions under uncertainty. And we can do that in fits, right? We can do that when we need to for a short period of time. But when it's protracted in the way that it has been now, just think about just maintaining that level of hypervigilance for months. Ultimately, that's going to have a really uh, negative impact on our physiology, uh, our mental well-being, and our physical well-being. So, um, it's yeah, it's a, probably a very uh, common uh, experience right now as a result of essentially being in crisis brain crisis mode for over a year. Anyone else? Hi, Deepa here. Um, hey. I just wanted to add, I, I feel exactly what Zahal is saying, where, um, you know, that short-term sort of memory loss, where did I hear that? Oh, you know, which Zoom call was it or meeting was it? I heard that, you know, comment that was made or that change that's going to be happening. And normally you'd be in the office and I think I'm more of a visual sort of person where I'd be like, oh yeah, it was in that meeting. We were sitting in that meeting room and it yeah. was that person who said it. Let me go follow up with them. And yeah, definitely feel you there, um, Zahal. There was another point that, um, Andrea made in the in the chat, which was just about the, um, you know, COVID hasn't helped because um, nothing else to do. So you're just ov overworking to fill that time. I've yeah. definitely been, yeah, moments where it's like, okay, well, I should actually log off now. I'm kind of, my work day is technically done. Um, but I'm just like, well, what, what do I have to do? There's nothing. And I think winter didn't help. It was definitely, that was kind of a tough time where it's like, oh, well, it's dark outside. I've got nothing to do. I'm not going anywhere. Um, why not just continue working for another 30 minutes, an hour, and then I can just yeah, make dinner and that's it kind of thing. So yeah, that was, um, that was tough to kind of yeah. break out of that habit. Yeah. I think that that's, that's, um, a really common experience right now is that, um, especially if you're someone who, you know, likes to get stuff done, um, you know, is more of what they were called type A, um, sort of personality where you're you're, you're organized, you're, you know, like to work on tasks and complete them. Um, that dead space in our schedules where we don't have any other options of things to do. It's very easy to just pick up the laptop and clear your emails. Right. But every time you do that, you're sucked back into the, you know, into work and into that stress. And again, you can do that over a short period of time, but over this long a period, it can have really, um, you know, deleterious effects on your, on your well being. Um, I, mean, I I've experienced that for years. Cause like I, I run my own business. So the line between my personal life and my work life has always been very blurred. So like, I'm, I'm used to it and I've found ways to, I, I've had to personally put in, uh, boundaries and be like, okay, I'm not checking my email from this time to this time. And to be honest, I backslid on all of that during the pandemic for the same reasons that, uh, that were just, um, mentioned. Hi, Aaron. It's Andrea. I don't know if you can hear me. Yep. Yes, we, we can. can. I was going to type this, but I thought I'd just say this. One of the things I'm worried about, cause I am one of those type A people is that by working excessively like this, we're setting a bar and an expectation for ourselves for the future that's just not going to be a you know possible to accomplish and this concerns me um because i'm that kind of person and i do have some ocd issues that when i go back on the road which is part of my role a lot of on the road time is not feeling um you know that i'm ever going to be caught up or like i feel like i'm setting this bar for myself without even realizing it, I, some, there's gotta be other people that feel like this too. Yeah. I think what's even more, uh, possibly worrisome is setting that bar for employers. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right? Is that like, now this is what they're going to expect. And if everything we've been reading and what's being studied about the mental health impacts of this, this is not sustainable at all. But once it's going to be very, it's going to require, it's weird because you've got these also opposing forces of um, kind of the acceleration of the democratization of workplaces where people, because remote work does at least in theory, give you more control over your day. 
workers are going to, and that's a big part of, of the democratization of labor is the idea that workers have more control over when they work, how they work, why they work, right? Um, so there's this kind of tension, I'd say, between, you know, the, the, this concept of um, feeling like you have more control over your day, but having set this precedent for employers that you're available all the time and something's going to have to give in that equation. Anyone else uh, feel the, the, you know, what, what Andrea has mentioned about her own, her own, you know, setting a standard for herself that might be too high? I'm wondering if Michelle wants to jump in. I see that you've got your hand up, maybe a, a related or, or even a different yeah, topic to jump ahead. in on. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi. Um, hi. Um, yeah, as soon as she started saying that, I, I was able to relate. And actually, today's my first day back from um, taking some PTO. Um, so good. It's yes. Um, usually uh, during PTO, you still kind of like check emails or, you know, do a little bit of work, um, find that time to maybe even, I want to say, quote unquote, catch up. <laughs> it's kind of strange that you have to catch up when you're already doing so much work. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and it um, I was able to just not do any and, um, it was really, it was really needed and it's, it was really good. So it's kind of hard though. I mean, I don't, I, I wish I felt more re-energized and refreshed, but I, I don't, but I do feel mentally better because I think I, I don't feel refreshed because I know that there's so much work, you know, ahead of me, which is okay. I'm just going to take it one at a time. And, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a balancing act for sure that I'm, I think I'm still trying to figure out and probably will need to try to figure out for a while now. But for me, it's not that I don't want to be able to work remotely. I do enjoy that flexibility, but it's just um, something that I guess I have to work out for myself. <laughs> I hope that oh, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, <laughs> well, well that's that's Oh, go ahead, Beth. I was just going to say, that's an excellent point, right? It is a very individual thing that we are all feeling. Um, we might have similar, like the texture of what we're feeling might be similar to someone else, but our own unique circumstances and arrangements and the way that we need remote work to work for us is going to be different by individual, right? So therein lies the challenge for employers as well, right? Is how going forward, do we actually begin to accommodate everybody's individual needs in a way that still allows us to have a united workplace culture and get work done, right? So um, did yeah, you want to add actually, something, Erin? Yeah, Michelle, it, it actually connects with, with the second uh, uh, counterintuitive thing that we found, which is that uh, so people are feeling more stress for all the reasons we all just talked about, uh, but they're taking less sick days this year. Um, so that's really interesting, right? You'd expect that if stress is higher, both the mental and physical um, impacts of that might lead to people taking more sick time, but no, it's taken, it's led to people taking less sick time. And so one of our hypotheses um, there is that the reason we're seeing that is there's a form of presenteeism that's happening. So you may not feel well enough, like in a normal times of working, you might not be feeling well and decide not to go into the office, maybe because it's just too hard or you don't want to spread whatever, you know, your, the cold you have. Um, but people feel like while they wouldn't be able to go in the office, they can lie on the couch and bang out a, a, a document. So there's kind of this... Um, but, but again, this is a really, um, dangerous game, right? So if people are feeling more stress and not taking time to, uh, recoup and recover like Michelle and, and of course, while we're still in the pandemic, I think the returns on those, 
on taking that time are going to be smaller than if like the context had has shifted like in a year from now taking time is going to be a bit easier because there'll be things to do and, and whatnot and you'll probably get more out of it um it's clear that taking no time is not gonna is 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 really going to negatively impact your well-being so that was sort of interesting um the other is that we thought maybe people um just given the broader economic forecasts may be scared to take time off uh just just because it means they're not making a contribution to projects it means that uh they might not be quote unquote pulling their weight and things like that so people are are more afraid to uh, to take that time off does that resonate with anybody here does anyone have um you know similar to michelle any experience with sort of taking time during this period or feeling like they can't? Anyone? There was some interesting um, data that aligned with uh, with what we were finding on the, the sick time front, Aaron. That was not our study. It was actually a study with uh, that Deloitte did. And they estimated that the, the cost to employers of uh, mental health related presenteeism was about three and a half times the cost of people just taking time off for mental health reasons, mm -hmm. right? So the, the long-term impact of you showing up and not being completely well and being tired, being always on, being burnt out, like that is ultimately going to have a greater toll on somebody and the employer um, than if you were just as an employer to make that sort of time off available to your people and have your managers actually remove the stigma, make it part of your general course of operating that you believe wellness actually includes mental well-being. So I think we've got a fairly long way to go still on that front with employers, but it definitely was one of the flags that raised, uh, you know, a concern for us as we were looking at the data. Yeah, if your sick day policy doesn't explicitly include mental health days, uh, then, you know, that that's a really regressive um policy and it's going to you know ultimately not be good for organizations or for the people yeah. uh, so um people have said you know i uh, there's a couple comments here like it's it's hard to book vacation when you know there's nowhere to go um but we still need to book that time to decompress and uh, uh maybe that people um don't have enough space at home to get some rest since the other members of the family are there too so those are really um you know, very pandemic related problems, right? That I agree, like when you, when I've taken time off during this period, like there's nowhere to go and to get away from the stresses is harder. Uh, and, and you can't actually change your physical location. So, you know, people might say, well, what's the point? Uh, and I think, you know, all, for most people, the point would be what's mentioned here is that at least a little bit of decompression, a little bit of stress reduction can go a long way right now, you know, because we're all kind of at this, you know, eight out of 10 of stress. So anything is going to push us outside that, that window of, of manageable stress, right? Uh, so if you can take some time off and lower that a little bit, that's like ultimately probably going to be good for you, but it's, it's not very, it's hard to get excited about taking time off right now. That's for sure. There's nothing to do, there's nowhere to go. Yeah, one one thing I've noticed is like, if I'm feeling sick, I, I still work almost every single time because the barrier to work is so low. Like yeah. to get to get out of my bed and get to my desk is, it's like a five step journey. And I can usually make that pretty much regardless <laughs> of how I'm feeling. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but Part of it is also like, like, like you said, like in, whether it's in your policy or whether it's like leaders in the organization setting the precedent, um, like I've noticed, like, like Bev will say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to hop off and go for a run for two hours and I'll, I'll finish up later. And just like seeing people do that, um, makes it so much easier for, for other people in the organization to, to take that stuff away as well. Yeah. It's kind of like a form of, uh, you know, role modeling, uh, and, and you're right. It's a leadership issue right it's it's um giving other people permission and showing that actually these are these are not only acceptable but 
um, could be really positive um, decisions and, and behaviors for you. Yeah, and I think some of the, the, the things that have been introduced for us here are, are different ways of working that actually enable people to live their integrated lives in a way that helps them be healthier too, right? Like this mode of working out loud where you, um, you know, you're not sort of just sitting alone in, in your vacuum doing what you need to do. Um, you're actually being very explicit with your team, what you're doing, when you're doing it, and everybody knows where everybody is um, for the most part. Um, the other amazing con construct that we have is this async communication way of working now, right? That also gives us tremendous amounts of flexibility if people embrace it and use it correctly. And if managers embrace it, right? That That is the key, the key message that we also saw in the study was, we know there's a lot of pressure on managers already, but they really are the vector for us to enable better wellness for people and to actually make remote work possible um, so that, you know, people like Vincent, who's just said that he feels comfortable because the, the leaders are modeling behaviors. Um, that's the kind of thing we need to see when we talk about stepping down or de-escalating from crisis mode. We've got to start rehumanizing the workplace, right? And I think that is really the crux of most of our findings is this need to bring this humanness back to everything we do. And that requires understanding, empathy, and compassion. Um, so maybe let's talk a bit about some of the findings with managers and the, the quality of the relationships there, Aaron. Do you, do you want to walk us through what we found there? Yeah. So um, what we found is that, again, this is another kind of counterintuitive thing, is that people, individual workers are being asked to shoulder more responsibility. So make more decisions, take on more tasks. Um, do things that um, they weren't being asked to do before, but uh, employees feel less supported by their managers. So at the same time that they're being asked to do more, they're being supported less or feel like they're being supported less. Um, and so we, we think that this is, you know, part of it is that idea that a lot of our relationships have become transactional, especially with our managers. It's like getting a meeting, what are the things I, you got it, here are the things you need to do. Okay, great. And go do them and you're off. Right. Um, and so that those kind of conversations around, okay, wh well, what do you need? How can I help? You know, things like walking over to someone's desk and just saying, Hey, I'm looking at this and I can't figure it out. Can you help me? Those things aren't sort of happening. It's like you're being tasked and then you're being cut off. Right. And go do it yourself. And some people thrive in that situation, but the majority of people require support and everybody requires help at some point. So that's a really, um, a really interesting finding about the relationship between managers and employees, very transactional, more responsibility is being pushed down to the employer employees, sorry. Uh, but they be given less support and what doesn't count as support is, you know, here's a bunch of remote work resources. So that's also what some people, what some organizations have done. Like here's this PDF on this, here's this e-learning module on communication in a remote setting. Those are fine. Like they can be helpful, but they don't help people like finish a project or remove an obstacle to a, a set of tasks that they're being asked to, to, to do. So um, yeah. So does anyone have uh, anything to say on that uh, experience like that, either from, you know, being, um, working with their manager or being a manager themselves? Do you feel like you're, do you feel like you're being asked to do more or less? My situation is a little bit different. I mean, in fact, my coworker Palavi is in this meeting, so don't quote me. <laughs> we we just got a new manager, and and of course, I mean, I mean, different manager has different way of doing things. But I said the same thing to her the other day in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, video meeting. I said the same thing to the previous two manager. And I said the same thing to the new manager. 
I said, uh, because of the, the type of our work, I'm constantly talking to my clients in overseas, right? I, by, uh, on LinkedIn. It's like a social media, right? Text, 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 and back and forth, back and forth, right? <clears throat> So I said to these, these managers, I mean, I appreciate that if you have something to ask us to do, I definitely would follow your order. I take orders, okay? But could you sort of reduce the, the length of your emails? Don't make it too long, right? Oh, it's okay. If you want to explain the background, the, the, the rationale behind all these things, behind your instructions, please, at the end of your email, just put down, you just use bullet point, one, two, three. I want you to do this, one, two, three. Because, because <clears throat> we are working remotely, you know, I miss the, the old days that I, 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 we get to do the, some sort of a brainstorming and chit-chatting and picking someone else's brain, right? And, and before we even go into a meeting and then we talk freely, and then after the meeting, we come up with the meet, meeting minutes for everybody to double check and, and then confirm the to-do list and who's to, who's to do what. But nowadays, it's like, I mean, after a long day and boom, uh, the email, okay. Uh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I feel that, I mean, I can only speak for myself, right? I feel that I've, I've, I've been losing my patience, right? <laughs> Reading through a lot of a text. That really killed me. But it, it depends on the mood that I have on that specific day. My mood is like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think what you're what you're pointing to there is that it's this transactional way of operating is exhausting, right? And there are these things that we're using to fill in for things that we used to have. So the face-to-face -face communication has been replaced by lengthy emails. And that is really hard for us to adapt to and to continue absorbing without our brains being fatigued by it. And I mean, Erin can talk to the physiological side of that, um, I'm sure, but just in terms of like what that makes us feel is, um, you know, completely drained. And that's why we, we need to get off this, um, you know, this trajectory that we're on and get back into, um, you know, we, we've basically normalized some really bad habits over the last year, which is what Andrea was alluding to, right? Um, and so how do we now step into accepting that remote work is here to stay along with, you know, hybrid work is the next frontier for us to tackle. Um, but we've got to take this as an opportunity to create some good habits for the better of work while we have the opportunity. And this opportunity, <laughs> I don't think comes along very often for any of us, right? So, um, Aaron, what else did we hear about the, the fact that remote work is here to stay? Yeah, so, um, you know, over three quarters of our respondents want to continue working remotely and they want to do that uh, at least two thirds of the time. So, um, you know, I guess we're talking like three days a week kind of thing, three, four days a week is what kind of people want to be able to do. Uh, I think probably people's ideal, like, I think, yeah, I, I think why people want that hybrid model is that that feeling of disconnection, they want to address that, but they want to maintain the freedom that's come with remote work. And I've been sort of fond of saying, you know, what we're doing right now is not really just remote work. It's remote work during a pandemic. So what would remote work look like when our broader uh, experience isn't overshadowed or uh, um, affected by this global health crisis? And I think what people want is the freedom that's come with remote work, but with the connection that comes with in-person work, office work. And um, so some sort of hybrid model is very likely to be where a lot of organizations land. And so it's really important that we address some of these problems that people are having. Because if people are working remotely two thirds of the time and are starting and are feeling isolated, what our research shows is that's ultimately not gonna be good for your organization. It's not gonna be good for you. So 
how do we balance these these things and that's the you know the great experiment that we've started here over the last year and will now continue like i don't think there's any you know putting there's no putting the the toothpaste back in the tube at this point people um have experienced what remote work is could be like without the pandemic and they want it and i think work places are going to have to offer that if they're going to win the war on talent right it's not a nice to have anymore it's going to be table stakes yeah and Aaron, do you think to some extent that people are prepared to put up with you know the the pain points of all these teething pains that we're having with figuring out what remote and hybrid work looks like because they do see the tremendous benefits they get from it um, with you know the commuters gone we've got more opportunity to integrate life and work. Um, we have more flexibility to to move around, um, you know, maybe relocate and be a remote worker that we might have, um, you know, not had in the past. I, I know in the Vancouver housing market, it's almost impossible to buy a home here in the city. So, you know, maybe people are seeing this as an opportunity to, to now be able to buy a home a little farther afield um, and be a remote worker and go into the office once every two weeks, right? So there's all sorts of things that have opened up to us. and. I think we may be prepared to put up with the difficulties for a little bit longer, um, but we do need to see the pressure come off just around the context of the, the socioeconomic trouble, you know, troubles that we're having with the global crisis continuing, right? So like you were saying, this isn't remote work. This is remote work with a very extraordinary set of circumstances. So we need those circumstances to settle down so that we can actually see the potential of, yeah. of remote work. Yeah, I think that that's the next, that's the next phase in this, but I don't think people like people are not going to want to go back to full time in the office and we have the technology to facilitate it. So why not? Um, I think is what people are going to be, um, thinking and also with the sort of the growth in the gig economy, um, and a lot of people kind of go, going out on their own. Uh, you're just going to see this like movement towards this kind of this freedom that people they can see it they can see how it could be great um, even if right now everything kind of sucks <laughs> I think there's also uh, this phenomenon I'm sorry deep I'll just yeah, have make one point and then I'll let you don't jump in deeper but there's this phenomenon of of employees being untethered now too, right, where um, they have more opportunities to add flexibility for their lives. They are able to make decisions that they might not have been able to make a year ago. So employers are needing to have a look at this as, um, you know, this is not a perk anymore, like you were saying. It's, it is now something that you need to have as part of your operating um, practice, um, whether you like it or not. Um, Deepa, what, what are you thinking? Um, I was just going to add in there, I think, um, I don't know if anyone else feels like this, um, I've kind of already been feeling a little bit kind of, a little bit of anxiety of like, well, when it comes to the point of deciding, I work here at Jostles, just so everyone here knows, um, when it comes to deciding, right, are we going to go back in the office? What is that going to look like? I'm someone who I do live on my own and I would like the flexibility, I would like to be able to kind of do. Um, maybe three days from the office, but I think there's been quite a few people that have been vocal and I've kind of heard from in my company and at Jostle kind of been like, oh my God, we can totally work remote and this works fine. We should totally get rid of the office and let's just go to 100% working remotely. And I'm just like, oh no, like what is gonna happen? Kind of really feeling a bit like, I want that flexibility. I would like to go into the office and yeah, I'm a pretty social person and wanna see people. Um, and have that interaction. Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of just touch on as well was when you do get those, it was what Daniel said, you know, you get a long email or um, a chat message or something with, you know, uh, you've got to get this, this and this done. Sometimes it's just how you interpret that and read it. And it's just like, I don't know, I might just read it and be like, oh, why are they being so aggressive? But it's like, you know, the language that they've used or the words that they've used maybe, and it's just like, well, they're not. And when you're in the office having that conversation face to face, you that body language part, you, you miss out on that, right? Like, oh, yeah, oh actually, lost in translation, right? Yes. Things get yeah. lost in translation yeah. through text and email. So it's so hard. The person doesn't know you that well. It's yeah. really hard to get those other cues 
uh, in there. Um, yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And it's yeah, and really that's... inefficient, right? Because then you end up having to explain yourself and, and all this time and energy gets put into communicating something that if we were together and you could tell from the tone of my voice or the fact that I'm smiling while delivering the thing that it was a joke or that you're yeah. poking fun or, you know, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, the other flags for us was that these norms and rituals and cues and other indicators of belonging have been muted, right? So the margin of error has widened for misunderstanding and for people feeling more disconnected because they don't have that uh, eye contact contract with people, right? You don't have the same emotional tether to people because you don't see them in person. So, um, you know, we know that humans need that in order to thrive, right? So I think that the future of work will be, uh, you know, best served by a combination of, of these ways of working. Uh, I think that that is ultimately what hybrid working is is going to be about is is taking the best of both worlds and creating something brand new, which I think is the, the greatest opportunity. And I think of of all the recommendations that we make in the in the research report is around this, um, you know, for for managers and leaders who are thinking about what their work environment looks like going forward. You may not have the answers right now, but you really should be talking to and asking your people what they would like it to look like and work with everybody to come to, um, you know, like Deepa, you were saying, you probably don't want Jostle to be a fully remote company because you like the in-person aspects of it, right? So um, it's so important to hear what, what everybody is thinking and then to try and collectively come up with an arrangement that works for most people because you know, obviously you, you, you can't keep everyone happy all of the time, but hopefully there's something in the new arrangement that is, is good for you, for every person. Um, Aaron, we're, we are just cruising up to the hour here rapidly, but I do want to touch on just maybe one or two key actions that people who are attending here today might think about. So what would you say is um, the most critical thing for everyone to go away and, and put into put into practice or even contemplate further today? Yeah, so you can look at, we have six recommendations in the report and you can read through them at the end. Um, three things that I've pulled out that I think are really important that are, and that are fairly um, straightforward to start to, to do. The first is de-escalating from crisis mode as soon as possible. Um, it's probably not possible yet, but the idea being how how quickly can us as individuals and our teams and organizations get out of this crisis thinking mode and refocus our efforts on the human side of work and relationships. And that's going to require a conscious, effortful decision to stop the short-term uh, manic kind of thinking and decision making we've been engaged in for quite a while it's it, we're now habituated to that kind of mindset we need to change that um the second is another mindset thing is that really we need to be encouraging leaders to shift their mindset from a transactional um mindset to a supportive one right and again that's going to bring humanity back into the workplace so less about tasking less about uh, time pressure, more about support. What do you need? How can I help you? Those are the kinds of questions that have to start to crop up and leaders are going to have to make it again, an effortful, active decision to get away from that, you know, extreme delegation mindset that we've had. Um, and then the final, uh, final one is that, um, it'd be really, um, helpful for people to look at their sick leave policy and explicitly like make sure it explicitly includes uh, mental health. And if it already does, encouraging people to use sick days for mental health reasons is a really important um, kind of advocacy that that can really make a huge difference for people. So those are the three high level, you know, the things I think are pretty doable uh, and pretty targeted. Again, you can read in our report, there's there's six of them with six high-level high um, recommendations with really practical operational steps that you can take um, to implement those. Yeah, and thanks, Aaron. What sits at the heart of each of those is just this emphasis on rehumanizing 
the the workplace right and just recognizing that you know workplaces exist because of people not in spite of people and that's you know that should be your rule of thumb going forward and actually that should be your sort of premise, whether you're in person or in um, in a remote setting, right? Um, we had already started to see the humanization of workplaces starting to take root, but um, I, I just think in the past year, um, you know, ironically, we've gotten to know each other more than we 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 might have if we'd worked in person in the past year, because we suddenly now have a window into each other's homes, right? And all the messy bits that go on with life in the background. So, um, you know, I think we've got to embrace um, the circumstance that we're under. Um, yes, video calls are here to stay. We've got to try and humanize them as much as we can. So, you know, look for those opportunities to reframe your meeting culture, um, add human aspects to, you know, arriving at a, at a meeting on Zoom, you know, play a game, have an icebreaker, find out something about the other people who are on the call. Um, it really helps to just sort of keep everyone centered and, and focused on, on getting to know each other and being there for each other, um, which is something we know has been important over the past year. So does anyone else have anything, any closing thought or idea they'd quickly like to throw in? I know there was some great contribution going on in the, in the chat. Um, I was really happy to see um, that some people, um, Andrea, you had said that your managers and your leadership has been incredibly positive and helpful, which is awesome to hear. And obviously we know that part of the stats in our our research report were also positive. Um, you know, it was great to see that some people were actually coping quite well. So um, I hope that there is something bright and and uh, useful um, coming out of this for everybody. And um, if anyone would like to quickly jump in, either in the chat um, or to close us off, please um, just unmute and say a few words. I can do that. I think thank you very much for this amazing uh, discussion. And even with this uh, one hour time, I felt connected. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Thank you. We, we appreciate the, the contributions that everybody made. And I, I feel quite um, buoyed by the conversation here today and, and really grateful that Erin and I could have collaborated on this work to be able to bring this and share it and, and um, sort of help people in the community continue to be well through this process. So. Um, Stay well. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, I will pop um, Aaron's details into the chat if anybody would like to reach out to him. Um, and if you'd like to find me, I'm just Bev Atfield on LinkedIn, so you can find me there. And uh, yeah, please keep in touch and, and please read the report, reach out um, and keep in touch. Mm -hmm.